Welcome to our September History Cafe, Sidewalk Stories with Seattle Walk Report. Thank you all for coming, including those of you who are tuned in to our live stream right now. I'm Sora, the Public Program Specialist here at Mohai, and for our low to no vision audience members, I'm a mixed white East Asian person with short brown hair, wearing a white shirt, black pants, and a pink vest. And today, we're going to be talking about exploring Seattle neighborhoods and enjoying our city. And I think before we do that, it's important to acknowledge whose land we're on. Here at Mohai, we're on the historic and contemporary lands and waters of the Duwamish, Suquamish, Muckleshoot, and all Coast Salish people. Historically, Native communities were forcibly removed from this city, but today we honor their uh, continued endurance with deep respect and gratitude for their unbroken stewardship of this place. We encourage you to visit the websites of local tribes to learn more about whose land you're on. Tonight's speaker, Susanna Ryan, is the author and illustrator of two really delightful books, Secret Seattle and Seattle Walk Report. They highlight histories and fun stories of local objects that we often overlook. I think you're going to laugh and smile a lot tonight. So without further ado. Thank you. In 2017, I, a devoted, lifelong indoor enthusiast, did the unthinkable. I left my Capitol Hill apartment for no reason. My feet hit the pavement and I just started walking. Any walking that had occurred in my life prior to this day was strictly out of necessity. Getting from point A to point B as quickly as possible so I could return to my one true love quietly sitting on the couch with a soft blanket. Stopping to smell the roses, optional physical activity? Thanks, but no thanks. I have other important things that I need to do, like drink tea and ignore my text messages. But there I was, walking without a destination for possibly the first time in my life. Most alarmingly, though, I was loving every second of it. Everything seemed interesting. Every street an opportunity to marvel over something magical or mundane. Every abandoned crocheted potholder on the sidewalk, a tiny story going untold. By slowing down and being more present in my environment, I felt like I was seeing my neighborhood in a whole new way. In a park a few blocks away from me, I found a Tamagotchi, one of those little keychain toys that was popular in the mid-90s hanging on a tree branch. I was hooked. After that day, my passion for walking and tolerance for blisters only grew. What began as walks around Capitol Hill expanded outwards to other neighborhoods, covering ground that would have seemed like an absolute nightmare only months before. I walked from, Queen, from Capitol Hill to Lake City, from Queen Anne to Beacon Hill, from wherever I was to wherever I found myself hours later, and then on my next day off, I would do it again. But as the miles and sights racked up, all my walks started blending together, and I feared that I was starting to forget the details of what had become an unexpectedly huge part of my life. Had I spotted that toaster hanging from a telephone wire in Wedgwood or Rainier Beach? Where had I seen that old golden retriever proudly carrying a pool noodle? I wasn't sure anymore. The thought of potentially forgetting something as delightful as an old golden retriever carrying a pool noodle was simply too much to bear. So as a way to remember my walks, I got the idea to create what I envisioned as an illustrated travel journal for my own city. Figuring I'd record the route and the mileage and draw whatever happened to catch my eye that day. While I've never had any formal training in drawing or art, it's just something I've always loved to do, and I've just never really had a great, consistent outlet for it. Starting a journal seemed like a satisfying way to combine my newfound love of walking with my lifelong love of drawing. The stakes couldn't be lower. I didn't plan on sharing this walking art project. I thought I would buy a cute new notebook and keep it to myself. Or more accurately, I thought I would buy a cute new notebook and then quickly lose interest. But after taking my notes on my next walk, five miles from Capitol Hill to the University District and creating the first entry, I felt something gnawing at me. Something told me that I should put this out there for other people to read. 
maybe no one would, but I felt like, why not share this thing that I'm totally going to do anyway? I can come up with a million reasons why not to do things. I love not doing things, but for once in my life, I couldn't come up with a reason. I downloaded Instagram, registered the name Seattle Walk Report, and shared the first installment. I definitely didn't go into Seattle Walk Report with a clear vision of what I was doing, what I wanted it to be, or where I wanted it to go. It sounds kind of corny, but walking had truly shown me the joy and the journey and not the destination, and I took that same approach to the comic. What mattered most to me was that every stressful balloon, elephant-shaped watering can, and Washington Mutual deposit bag in a bush spotted on a walk would be memorialized forever. Somehow, some way, well, through word of mouth and algorithms, people did discover the comic. I just kept plodding along at two miles an hour, and yet suddenly it felt like I was living life in the fast lane. In May 2018, about nine months after I started the project, I was approached by local publisher Sasquatch Books about potentially turning it into a book. I was not expecting this at all, but I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm definitely a competent grown-up who you should for sure give a book deal to, and not just an extremely passionate weirdo with too much time on her hands and a hobby that escalated quickly. Sure, I'll make a book, I got this. That book, conveniently titled Seattle Walk Report, was released in 2019 and went on to be a regional bestseller and Washington State Book Award finalist. It chronicles the sights and sounds from 65 miles of walking through different Seattle neighborhoods, from a Ballard beaver I saw at Golden Gardens to a dollar I found under a tree in Rainier Beach. And if I do say so myself, nicely encapsulated the wandering spirit and love of ephemeral discoveries that had made me fall in love with walking to begin with. While I was working on the book, I didn't have as much time to walk around for hours on end. So with the book now out in the world, I looked forward to reconnecting with walking and was eager to see all the hot new Seattle trash trends that had emerged in my absence. <laughs> but something started to change when I got back into a walking routine and I found myself becoming increasingly interested in the things around my walks that were a little bit more permanent. Whereas before I might have said, ooh, a banana peel on a lamppost, this is so exciting. I thought, hmm, I wonder about the lamppost under this banana peel. I realized that the overlook fixtures on our streets, the utility covers and fire hydrants likely had stories all their own. I didn't exactly know what to do with what I was seeing though. By then I had pretty much figured out the Seattle Walk Report format and formula and doing intensive research to wax poetic about mundane infrastructure topics wasn't really part of that formula. So I just kept walking and sharing the comic like usual on Instagram while my phone filled up with photos I was taking on all these of all these other things that I was seeing on my walk. I told myself that maybe I'd try to find out more someday, do a little bit of research, or maybe not. It seemed like a lot of work. But then I saw something that would change my life forever. I was walking with a friend in Capitol Hill a few months after the book had come out. While my friend was talking to me about something, I stopped dead in my tracks. Like an angel from on high, I saw something beautiful radiating from the side of a building on 14th and Pike, the old Seattle Artificial Limbs Company building, which I had walked by approximately one billion times before. I crouched down. The air stood still. For a brief moment, it felt like me and the Seattle Artificial Limbs Company building were the only two things on earth because there on the side of this door stood a small rectangular door at ground level. In the middle of this little door was a shield-shaped emblem embossed with the words, Clark's Coal Chute, patented July 24, 1906, T.F. Clark, Seattle. To say it was love at first sight is an understatement. I wanted to start a life with this coal chute. While crouched down, I did a quick internet search for Clark's Coal Chute, expecting legions of Seattleites to be talking about this going back decades, with glitzy profiles in the Seattle Times with this absolute hero of a coal chute door. Instead, no results. 
zero, not one. Everything I had seen over the past few months that was mild, that I was mildly curious about, those things I said that maybe I would research someday, they couldn't hold a candle to Clark's coal shoot. I simply had to know more. So I went all in, digging through census records, newspaper databases, and photo archives, determined to piece together what I could about this mysterious man, T.F. Clark, and his beautiful, beautiful coal chute door that he was brave enough to name after himself. A coal chute door that somehow, despite it all, despite the use of coal as fuel being basically dead in Washington State for over a century, was still standing. Truly an inspiration. A few weeks after seeing the coal chute door for the first time and knee deep in my research, I returned to Fort Keith and Pike in the daytime to get a better photo of this object of my affection. Butterflies in my stomach, I'm all excited. I turn the corner and the coal chute door is gone, replaced with a piece of plywood. A rented dumpster stood nearby. Had it all been a dream? No. I know what me and that coal chute had was real. That moment at 14th and Pike, it all became clear. Clark's coal chute may be the one that got away, but what other tiny details of our cityscape and the stories behind them risked being lost without anyone ever having noticed they were there to begin with? Once I looked at the photos I had taken and thought about what I knew and what I would like to know about this living history, and I had the outline for a book. I got the green light to make the book in March 2020, a completely unremarkable month that you probably don't remember because <laughs> nothing really happened or anything. With my normally bustling social calendar suddenly empty, those early pandemic days were a great opportunity to do the kind of research deep dives this book would require, like spending six hours digging through turn of the century trade publications with names like sanitary and heating age and skimming hundred year old municipal construction manuals. With libraries and archives closed, I had to rely almost entirely on online resources for my research and get creative with finding information. I really had no idea when I created the book outline whether or not I would be able to find anything at all about the things that I was curious about. And if I did, if those stories would be compelling enough to share. To my surprise, almost everything I wanted to investigate, I could, and almost everything had an interesting story, except for traffic control boxes. There is nothing interesting to say about traffic control boxes. I tried so hard. So how did I do it? I'm going to take you through some of the sidewalk stories I dug up for Secret Seattle, along with the stories behind the stories, how I stumbled across the things that ended up being included in the book, and how I was able to learn more about them, all from the comfort of my couch, and then take you through some of my favorite resources that you can use to learn more about the history and mystery in your neighborhood. No one asked, but if I had to pick my top celebrity of the Seattle sidewalk, I'd say it's downtown and Pioneer Square's ornamental streetlights called cluster lights. If you've been downtown at any point in the last hundred years, you may not have known it, but you were living among legends. With their white globe-like lights in groups of three or five and thoughtfully designed bases, this style of streetlight has been lining Seattle's busiest thoroughfares for over a century. The idea for the city's cluster lights dates back to the 1900s, when Seattle had a mission to become the best lighted city in America ahead of the 1909 Alaska and Yukon Pacific Exposition, Seattle's first World's Fair. Buzz over a plan to install streetlights began in 1906, but it wouldn't be until January 1909 that Third Avenue's 117 cluster lights were first illuminated. The city went wild. Within weeks, Petitions and permits were flying from business owners and citizens across the city, eager to see the lights on their own blocks, and the lights quickly became a selling point to downtown living. Everybody is trying to get onto 3rd Avenue to enjoy the cluster lights. Don't blame them, read an apartment ad from February 1909. Soon, the cluster lights spread to 1st and 2nd Avenues, and Seattle's best lighted ambitions were realized. Directory publisher R.L. Polk, visiting in June 1909 to get an early look at preparations for the expo, called Seattle one of the handsomest cities in the entire country. 
and remarked that the cluster lights along the avenues give the whole section an appearance of splendor difficult to describe. After visiting in September 1909, the mayor of Atlanta agreed, saying, Seattle has a lot of things that we want down in Atlanta, and cluster lights is one. <laughs> the lights continued to be the talk of the town in the years that followed. The Times wrote in 1912 that the attractive street lights of the metropolis of the Pacific Northwest have been a source of wonder and admiration to visitors ever since the cluster system was installed. At a meeting to discuss the merits of various types of street lighting that same year, an electrical engineer remarked, I think Seattle has the finest example of street illumination from post and cluster lights that there is in this country. I will go further and say the cluster lamps in Portland are not one third as good. <laughs> wow, Portland! <laughs> so embarrassing. You call that a cluster light? While there have been refurbishments or replacements to the city's cluster lights over the years, and the ones that you waltz past today may not be the exact same ones that were there a century ago, there is something sweet to me about this little aesthetic continuity in our streetscapes. I recently came across a photo of myself from a third grade field trip to Pioneer Square, fun times, and you can see a tiny little cluster light in the background. Aww, you're going to write the book on cluster lights one day. Aren't you, aren't you excited? In the 1911 Seattle City Light Annual Report, which I read all of so you don't have to, it made me a little proud to see that under facts worth knowing about Seattle, right under Seattle has no blizzards, cyclones, cloudbursts, droughts, or poisonous insects or reptiles, they could claim with certainty that Seattle is the best lighted city in America. The cluster light story was cobbled together mainly through a deep dive in the Seattle Times newspaper archives. Fully digitized editions of the Seattle Times and the Seattle Post Intelligence or newspapers are available for free with a Seattle Public Library card. These are searchable, so in an instant, you can enter a word or phrase and see every time it has appeared in these newspapers over the last 120-something years. It's pretty incredible. This is often my first stop when doing research about local topics because it can be really valuable and interesting to read about how things were talked about while they were happening, and not just whatever bits and pieces of the story stood the test of time. Sometimes it can be tricky to figure out how something was referred to at the time it was being talked about, though, so that you know what to search. When I initially sought to more, learn more about these lights, I thought of them as street lights. But what I call something in my 2020 brain may not be what somebody called something in 1950 or 1900 or whenever. Lucky for me, before I went to the newspaper archives, I had stumbled upon a very short article on the wonderful website historylink.org. Woo! written in 1999 by Heather M. McIntosh, titled, Seattle City Light Installs an Ornamental Street Lighting System in 1909. The article was very brief and essentially just said that in preparation for the Alaska Yukon Pacific Expo, the city had upgraded their hanging street lighting to more ornamental fixed street lights. While the article itself didn't say the word cluster lights, the image that accompanied the article from the 1911 Seattle City Light Annual Report did, showing photos of three styles with cluster lights used in Seattle written across the top. Knowing that these were called cluster lights around the time they were installed was an invaluable clue. Thank you, History Link. When I searched for cluster lights in the newspapers and sorted my results from oldest to newest, I was able to slowly piece together the story you just heard. Another story that I'm happy to have shed light on is the secret world of Seattle's sidewalk stamps. In the early 1900s, Seattle was ready to upgrade their wooden plank walkways to the latest and greatest in sidewalk technology, concrete. At that time in many cities, it was a common practice for contractors selected for a paving job to stamp their work with their name as a form of advertisement and to celebrate a sidewalk well paved. Across the city today, you can still find these sidewalk stamps, denoting a sidewalk that is likely over 100 years old. One of the most common sidewalk stamps I've seen in Seattle is from the Sparger Concrete Company, founded by Robert L. Sparger. I feel fairly confident that the Sparger Concrete Company paved more of Seattle sidewalks during the concrete sidewalk boom of the early 1900s than any other contractor. 
Sparker was very enthusiastic about concrete. He just loved the stuff. In 1910, he constructed the entire first floor of his Queen Anne home with concrete, floors, walls, and all. A little concerning, but we all have our passions, right? He wrote to the engineering department requesting permission to use concrete pipes to connect houses to sewer lines and received a response that said most emphatically no. And then in 1929, in the sensitive words of the Seattle Post Intelligencer, Sparger dropped dead at the age of 65. But his sidewalks live on. Unlike the very prolific Sparger Concrete Company, my second favorite sidewalk stamp I've actually only seen one of, near West Lee Street and an alley near 7th Avenue West on Queen Anne, but there may be more. It's the mark of John Granger Pierce. He's sort of the bad boy of the Seattle sidewalk stamp scene. John Pierce had moved to Seattle in, in 1900, eager to leave his life in Sioux City, Iowa behind, and with good reason. His dad, a real estate developer, developer also named John Pierce, needed a fresh start after staging a fake mansion raffle where he had promised to give his entire 21-room mansion to one lucky winner. After selling over 40,000 tickets nationwide at a dollar a piece, it was revealed that the whole thing had been fixed to pay for some New York millionaire that Pierce owed money to. So the whole family just up and left, doing what people do and making their way to Seattle as mansion raffle grifters do. <laughs> the younger John started working as a contractor and eventually got appointed to the Seattle City Council in 1911 after a council member had to resign due to illness. When a seat was up for election the following year, Pierce decided to run, winning endorsements from business owners in town and other civic leaders. He won only to resign two years later when it was revealed that he had illegally sought contributions for the campaign of someone running for Seattle mayor. But I guess he must have been doing something right with his sidewalks because at least one of them is still here, a little concrete reminder of disgraced former Seattle City Council members that <laughs> I started noticing names imprinted in sidewalks pretty much as soon as I got into walking, but I never really stopped to look closely or think much about them. In December 2019, though, I took a walk around Montlake, where I befriended a very nice cat. And as I was petting the cat and telling the cat about my day, the cat just waltzed over to a sidewalk stamp. It was hard to read, a faint impression worn down by years of rocks and wheels and weather, but I was curious in a way that I hadn't been before. I decided that I would take a picture whenever I saw one of these, no matter how faded, to get a sense of how prevalent they were, and to see if I could figure out a who's who of these minor cement celebrities. As soon as I started looking out for sidewalk stamps, the Sparger Concrete Company name appeared time and time again on sidewalks across the city. I was able to figure out pretty easily online that this was a common practice for some cities, but so I knew the general gist of what I was seeing, it was just a matter of learning more about the ones in Seattle specifically. Before heading over to the newspaper archives, I did an internet search for Sparger Concrete in quotes. One of the first results was from the Pacific Coast Architecture Database, a database created by Alan Michelson, now head of the Built Environments Library at the University of Washington which provides information on buildings and architects of California, Oregon, and Washington. The, the entry featured a house in Queen Anne. It read, this house was notable for its extensive use of reinforced concrete. The first floor, walls and floors, were constructed of concrete. Robert L. Sparger had a lot of concrete at his disposal as he was president of the Sparger Concrete Company. This firm laid many of the sidewalks in Seattle. In just a few short sentences, there were a lot of great clues here. The Sparger Concrete Company was local and prolific. I have the name Robert L. Sparger, along with an address where he lived in his concrete Queen Anne kingdom. This was more than enough to begin a newspaper splunking session. In the case of John Pierce, the unique spelling of the family name helped crack the case. Pierce is spelled P-E-I-R-C-E -E, instead of the more common P-I-E-R-C-E. -E. John Pierce, spelled with the I before the E, seems like such a common name that searching around would be difficult and likely turn up an overwhelming number of Johns, making me give up pretty early. 
Thanks to the less common spelling, though, when I searched for John Pierce online, I got interesting results. Several articles from Sioux City, Iowa historical societies and news outlets about this major figure in Sioux City's development, who also may have, you know, staged a magic raffle and had to leave town. Greedy non, it was briefly mentioned that he had moved to Seattle eventually. I was immediately hopeful that this was the same guy as my contractor stamp, but it just wasn't quite adding up. They said that this John was born in 1840, and the sidewalk I had seen was likely from the early 1900s. It seemed surprising to me that he would be out living the contractor life into his 60s. He was in the Civil War. Taking things over to the newspapers and searching for John Pierce, though, I was met with articles about a Seattle City Council member with that name. And eventually, I was able to piece together the family connection. Before noticing sidewalk stamps, I had never really considered that some of our sidewalks may be the original, but it makes total sense. If it isn't broken, why would the city spend money to fix it? Like cluster lights, it's cool to think about these little continuities in our neighborhoods and all the Seattleites who have made their way across these same sidewalks over the years. But what about the coal chute door turned piece of plywood that started it all? It's now a window, by the way. After the utter devastation of seeing Clark's coal chute removed from the former Artificial Rims Company building, I sulked away to gather my thoughts. Like a phoenix rising from the coal ashes, another Clark's coal chute appeared before me, and another. Peppered across the city's buildings were these little remnants from the past. Rusty ones, ones in pairs, one's good for taking selfies with. It was incredible and only solidified my commitment to telling the Clark's Coal Chute story one way or another. Clark's Coal Chute creator Theodore Clark was himself a longtime Capitol Hill resident. Born in New York in April 1847, we're both Tauruses, Clark, a sheet metal worker, moved to Seattle in the 1880s and set up shop manufacturing portable camp stoves that would go on to be popular with the thousands of men flocking to Alaska with dreams of striking it rich in the gold rush. He patented what would later become Clark's coal chute in 1906. Before natural gas or electric heat, many people used coal to heat their homes or businesses, and coal chutes were a convenient way for coal merchants to deliver this much needed resource. Typically, these chutes would lead to a coal bin or special room in the basement. In his patent application, Clark writes enthusiastically about the latest and greatest in coal chute door technology. This one has certain new and useful improvements and a neat and attractive appearance. I think we can all agree on that last point. Yes. <laughs> Clark also designed his coal chute to be burglar proof, so would-be intruders couldn't slide into your home and steal your stuff, a surprisingly common problem of the coal chute era. The coal chute appeared to be a hit, and within five years, Clark had sold over 1,400 coal chutes in Washington and Oregon. Time marches on, though, and by 1920, Clark had given up his business, likely due to old age. He died on December 4th, 1921. It is unknown how many of Clark's coal chutes were eventually, were eventually installed or how many still exist, but on 18th and Thomas, only two blocks away from Clark's longtime home, there is a Clark's coal chute on the side of an apartment building. Wouldn't it be weird if your name was two blocks away from where you live now in 2122? You hope it's for something good, but who knows? My life and walks have been enriched tremendously since learning these stories and others about the everyday things that surround us. If you've ever been curious about something in your neighborhood or wanting to learn more or wanting to research local history, there are a ton of great resources to help you get started. I'm going to focus on my favorite resources that are available online for free or available for free if you have a Seattle Public Library card. The first is digital newspapers. Like I mentioned, fully digitized editions of the Seattle Times and the Seattle Post Intelligence are, are available for free with the Seattle Public Library card. To access them, you go to the library's website, spl.org, click on online resources at the top of the page, click magazines and newspapers, and then scroll and scroll and scroll and you're going to keep scrolling until you get to either the Seattle Times or the Seattle PI. Log in with your library card number and PIN and then you're in. I'm telling you this because I really genuinely want you to do it. 
While you can casually browse old issues or find out what the headlines were on the day you were born, what I typically do is search for a particular term, a place, a name, an address, or a thing. Then I'll sort the results from oldest to newest. Or if I have a particular time frame I'm interested in, I will narrow the results down to just that time frame. Research aside, this is also some cheap entertainment. One night I searched for the phrase fine felines in the Times to see if in 127 years the Seattle Times had ever said those two words together. And they did exactly once on November 7, 1913 with this. High praise from Eastern cat expert. Mrs. Elizabeth L. Brace of New York says Pacific Northwest has as fine felines as anywhere else. <laughs> Extols efforts of Secretary Grasdale, whoever that is. Rhododendron Duke, owned in Seattle, declared to be finest blue-eyed white male in country. Rhododendron Duke is a cat, for the record, and the best cat name I have ever heard. Next thing I'm reading sentences like cat shows or something like baby shows, and a few related searches later and I was learning all about the inner workings of the Queen Anne Cat Club and how they used to host their cat show on the fourth floor of the former Bon Marche building downtown. And now I'm imagining beautiful cats batting at curtain tassels at the Bar Marche. And I think to myself, wow, all this fun just because I tried to search for fine felines in the newspaper database on a wild Friday night. <laughs> really, I encourage you to try just dipping a toe into the archives. Just search for whatever. It's really fun. I like to supplement the local newspapers available through the Seattle Public Library with this Library of Congress's incredible digitized newspaper project called Chronicling America, which provides access to dozens of Washington State newspapers and other periodicals through the decades, including the Seattle Star newspaper, early Seattle Black-owned newspaper The Seattle Republican, and Seattle's Filipino Forum newsletter. I find Chronicling America's interface a little bit harder to figure out, so I don't recommend starting there. But once you feel confident in your newspaper diving skills, I definitely recommend checking it out. Another thing I love are the photo archives avail available through MOHI, woo, the University of Washington, the Seattle Public Library, and for mega nerds, the Seattle Municipal Archives. Photographs tell stories in ways that words cannot. I read about how people went wild for cluster lights, but it wasn't until I saw a photo from, of them from 1914 in the, in the Seattle Municipal Archives that I really understood it. The photo shows an almost comical number of five bulb cluster lights lining First Avenue at night, going back as far as the eye can see. Their light reflects off the streetcar tracks in an otherwise dark city. In a few short years, Seattleites went from living in a city that was pretty much pitch black after the sun went down to suddenly seeing the light. It really puts things in perspective. Primarily, though, I love how easy it is to have serendipitous encounters in the Seattle or in the um, photo archives. I was working on a section of my book called Seattle's Best Utility Covers, in which I host a beauty pageant for Seattle's most eligible utility covers. And long story short, I wanted to know if a particular Puget Sound Power and Light Company utility cover I saw near Pike Place had been there in 1992. While researching brick and cobblestone streets in Seattle for a different part of my book, I found myself looking at the Seattle Public Library's Warner Leggenhauer Photograph Collection, a wonderful collection of photos from a Boeing, a Boeing employee and hobby photographer who captured many details of Seattle's architects, signs, and scenery throughout the mid-20th century. By chance, I found a photo of that very same utility cover I had seen that he took in 1978, confirming that the cover had been there in 1992. Even if you're not on a research journey quite like the one I was, these photo archives are an incredible resource for discovering more about your neighborhood and gaining a better understanding of your surroundings. Like the newspaper archives, you can search for a particular term or name, but often I prefer just browsing the different categories and special photo collections and see what captures my interest. I highly recommend checking them out. Lastly, if you're specifically curious to learn more about buildings and houses, the Seattle Department of Neighborhoods has a Seattle Historic Site Search 
that can be a great way to get background information on Seattle structures. This resource pulls together information about some of the city's buildings and houses from old property records, directories, and other sources. While there isn't an entry for every single building and the level of detail varies, some of these go into an incredible amount of depth, not only about the individual structures and the people who may have been connected to it, but it paints a portrait of the neighborhood at the time it was built, providing valuable context. If you don't address, you can search to see if there is a result, but my favorite thing to do is use the search by property attribute option, where you can select a neighborhood and a year or date range and see all the property listings that meet your criteria. For example, just for illustrative purposes for this presentation, I searched for buildings built between 1910 and 1920 on North Beacon Hill to see what would turn up. There were three results, and in a click, I learned that renowned Seattle artist George Sutakawa once lived in a house I've walked by countless times in Beacon Hill. I know that street well. It has a little free seed library and a sidewalk stamp I can't read. And now you're telling me George Sutakawa once lived there? Next time I walk down that street, it will be an even richer experience thanks to the historic site search. If you're super interested in the topic of research, the Seattle Public Library, in collaboration with the King County Archives, put together a document a few years ago called Researching the History of Seattle and King County Buildings, and it is fantastic. Definitely one of my fall 2022 reading recommendations. While it centers around researching buildings, it has a ton of links to resources that are useful for learning about local history in general and is a must-see. Like I said earlier, I was amazed that I was able to do all of the research for my book utilizing the wealth of information available online. I feel like a lot of research type stuff can seem sort of intimidating, like where do you even start? But I encourage you if you have any interest in this topic to just start somewhere. Pick a resource and explore what it can do. You may just be surprised at what you find. But for all I could dig up, there was always one sidewalk mystery that stumped even this intrepid walk reporter that despite various efforts over the years, I could not find much of anything about other than that it had stumped many others before me. Around Seattle in neighborhoods like Queen Anne, Capitol Hill, and Ballard, there are these sidewalks that have the name of the street embedded in the concrete at its intersections, either with metal letters that are about two inches high or set in small blue tiles with a white tile background. The tile ones are especially abundant along East Madison Street as you get cl close to Lake Washington. There are a ton of them. I wanted to know more about these. I wanted to know anything about them, honestly. When were they installed? Was this some established thing that Seattle did for a while and then stopped? Some special project or something else? Right away, the prospect of ever getting to the bottom of this seemed grim. The very first thing my initial general internet search turned up was an online Seattle PR, PI article from 2015 titled, Little Known About Old Street Signs Found in Ballard and Downtown Seattle Sidewalks, about how little is known about old street signs found in Ballard and Downtown Seattle Sidewalks. Not super promising. The article had been inspired by a post by local author David B. Williams, author of the book Seattle Walks, on his blog Geology Writer, titled Name That Street. Williams wrote that while he wasn't able to figure out exactly when the names were put in or who did it, he did find a resolution that the city adopted in 1902, which said that all concrete sidewalks laid in the city of Seattle shall have the names of the streets countersunk in plain letters at the street's intersections. But Williams couldn't say for sure if this was ever fully adopted or related to the names around the streets today. One moment. I'm missing a page, so I'm going to pull it up on my phone. Like 
earlier adventures in the newspaper archives, this case seemed especially tricky. What I normally do when I begin to research something in the newspaper archives is just search for the name of that thing. But I couldn't think of what to call these or what words might turn up in articles about them, if any articles had ever been written about them at all. I felt like I was looking for a needle in a haystack and I wasn't even sure if the needle existed. I tried searching for some little phrases like blue and white tile, tile sidewalk, or metal letters embedded in cement. Nothing was giving me much of anything on any of the resources I tried. I was hoping to solve this mystery for my book, Secret Seattle, but I wasn't having any luck. I needed to cut my losses and move on, so I finished the book and put this mystery out of my head the best I could. But every good sidewalk detective that knows that sometimes the clue you need most happens when you least expect it. It all started with a contractor stamp on 20th and Mercer, bearing the name Jay Calvert, that I spotted shortly after Secret Seattle had come out. Even though the book was done, my love of sidewalk stamps was far from over. When I began to research the name, I learned that contractor John Calvert was, how do I put this gently, maybe not the best contractor in Seattle? In 1903, he was awarded a contract to add cements to add cement walkways to another to a number of streets around Denny Way and Third Avenue in Belltown, which at the time was a working class neighborhood popular with the people who worked nearby along the waters, waters of Puget Sound. In preparation for the new walkways, the streets were torn up, the existing wooden plank sidewalks were, were, were removed, and then Calberg and his crew did absolutely nothing for 50 Teen months. The Seattle Times wrote in December 1904 that the thoroughfares have been seas of mud and water, where people who live in the street can hardly get in and out of their houses. They don't do it without wading through mud almost up to their knees for, I repeat, 15 months. Calvert was far from the only subpar contractor in the city, though. There wasn't a ton of oversight for the city's contractors in the early 20th century. Basically, the city would put out a notice to pave or regrade sidewalks or roads or wherever it was. Contractors would submit their bids, and whoever was the lowest bidder got the job. It didn't really matter if they had the capacity or expertise needed for a project. Bid the lowest, it's yours. See you when you're finished, hopefully. It turns out that maybe this is not the most effective way to run a city. The PI wrote in December 1904, the city has had so much trouble lately with contractors and contract work that officials propose to probe into existing conditions and see if something can be done to improve matters. The officials have declared that the time has come when a reckoning must be made and the city must take steps to protect itself from the procrastinating tendencies of the contractors who are engaged in city work. Affairs have reached such a stage that some of the councilmen have determined that their constituents shall not suffer at the hands of contractors any longer. So while Calvert alone wasn't the catalyst for the city to reconsider their approach to municipal construction matters, the ongoing situation in Belltown was severe enough of an example of contractor inaction that Calvert sort of had to take the fall for a problem that extended far beyond him and was called before the city to explain himself. The very same day he went before the council, 15 months after the sidewalks had been torn up in Belltown, Calvert became very active in the words of the PI and placed a full force of men at work laying sidewalks in double quick time. He is incidentally demonstrating, the council claim, that the sidewalks could have been laid a long time ago if the men had been put there to do the work. Classic. Anyway, sometimes when juicy drama is unfolding in the newspaper archives, as was happening with John Calvert, I will just glance through every article from a certain time period related to that person or thing. There were only about 100 articles across the Times and PI with Calvert's name from 1890 until 1930, the period I figured he was likely most active in, based on the other things I had seen. So it was easy enough to glance at them all. Strangely, my pre-pandemic social calendar hadn't picked that up yet. <laughs> I got to a very short article in the PI from December 1904 titled, Calvert Hearing Tomorrow, 
with a quick note that Calvert was going to appear before the Board of Public Works the following day. Not super exciting, but my eyes wandered down to the next short article directly below that one. I won't read the whole thing now and spoil it, but it mentions something very interesting, something that sounded a whole lot like my blue and white tile signs, tiling street signs in pavement, I guess. Long after I thought all hope was gone and had moved on, I finally had my first contemporary, contemporaneous newspaper clue in the age-old sidewalk street name mystery. Hand shaking, heart racing, I searched for the phrase tiling street signs in the newspaper archives, and the only result was the one I had just seen. Still, this was some valuable information. I had a year to go off of, 1904, and knew that at that time, these may have simply been referred to as street signs. I hadn't fully considered that, because when I think of street signs, I strictly think of the ones on posts. I'm ashamed to admit that I was narrow-minded in my idea of what a street sign could be. <laughs> now, keen observers may be like, but Susanna, the very first thing you ever came across was that 2015 Seattle PI article with the headline, Little Known About Old Street Signs Found in Ballard and Downtown Seattle Sidewalks. You did not need to become Seattle's foremost John Calvert expert to get to this point. And then I say, isn't the real joy the disgrace general contractors we met along the way. <laughs> anyway, I did what one does, and knowing this information, I searched for just the term street signs in the Times and PI. 1,547 results. My clue, this article that mentioned Thailand street signs, was from 1904. So I narrowed the street sign search to just the decades between 1890 and 1920. There were only 107 results, which is totally manageable and what results they were. I will now, for the first time publicly, present my findings. <laughs> Seattle newspapers at the turn of the 20th century didn't mince words when it came to the disorder on the city streets. Hopeless, wrote the Seattle PI in February 1900. Chaos, they said in May 1900. Nothing so embarrassing, the Seattle Times declared in October 1902. They were talking, of course, about street name signs, or more accurately, the near complete lack of them. Won't it be funny when legible street signs are put up in Seattle, a Seattle Star newspaper headline asked in December, January 1902. At the time, the city of Seattle had no requirement or regulations on their use, no standard comprehensive system for installing them across the growing city's many streets which were described as a labyrinth where visitors and longtime residents alike could walk for miles without having any idea of the barriers. <laughs> the city had made several half-hearted attempts over the 1890s to slap some cheap tin signs around town and call it good, but it wasn't enough. The signs were no match for the dreaded grasp of the small boy and were the constant targets of vandalism by children. The following is just one harrowing account of Seattle's small boy street sign antics from the Seattle PI on February 8, 1901. Destroyed street signs. Small boys accused of vandalism by the city authorities. The article goes on to say, small boys are undoing the work of the city water department, which has nearly completed the placing of street signs on all graded thoroughfares. Superintendent L.B. Young's says that many of the signs have either been pulled off of their places or have been defaced in such a manner as to make them illegible. The work was commenced by the department about a month ago, but as a result of the vandalism, much of it may have to be done over again. An October 1902 letter to the editor of the Seattle PI, written by the former owner of the PI, Thomas Proch, recounts the long-standing Seattle signage drama in no uncertain terms. The periodical agitation over and about street signs is again upon us. Every three or four years it is renewed. The municipal authorities yield gracefully, and as a result, several hundred or thousand new tin signs are placed upon poles and walls at corners throughout the city. 
Almost immediately, their destruction begins. The people whom the signs are intended to serve seem to be impelled to efface or obliterate them. or tear them down. Their absence is noted, and the cry for signs again goes out from the public. And again and again, the operation described is repeated. <laughs> Probst was among a growing number of citizens in favor of signing the pro solving the signage problem once and for all by embedding or stamping street names in the sidewalks creating a sign that no small boy could easily steal. <laughs> the timing was perfect. A great Seattle paveway was underway, with many of the city's streets about to get concrete sidewalks for the first time. Why not take this opportunity to add street names as well? City officials agreed, with City Council President Will Perry saying he had heard a rumor that street signs with bronze or brass letters were now in vogue in a number of cities in the East. Ooh and introducing a resolution in late October 1902 requiring that all concrete sidewalks going forward have the name of the street embedded at each intersection. This was the one that author David Williams found. The same resolution directed the Board of Public Works to research the various types of such signage available, along with their prices, and report back post haste. Board of Public Works Secretary and dreamy nerd Clarence Bagley delivered on the promise, presenting his findings in December of that year. In a classic Seattle City Council moment, Bagley found that for some reason, they couldn't just buy the individual metal letters they needed for any given street. They would have to buy countless complete sets of the entire alphabet, plus a complete set of numerals in order to complete the task. As the Seattle Times astutely noted, if bronze or brass alphabet alphabets are procured, it will require many of these. For some names, such as 19th Avenue South, require letters repeated four or five times. I'm sure Clarence Bagley was like, can I buy a vowel? <laughs> Thank you. The sets were expensive too, between $12 and $30 for a single set of letters depending on the size, which is about $400 to $1,000 today. This would be no cheap undertaking. One moment. But the council president had already heard a rumor that these were cool and had already passed this resolution requiring embedded names. So they were like, I guess we have to do this. At the same time, though, the board and council began openly lusting after the new iron signs used by the Seattle Electric Railway Company for their streetcars. And who wouldn't? What with their blue background with white letters, about as distinctive and pretty as could be adopted, according to the Times. The council was torn. Should they invest in those small boy-proof embedded street names or try to invest in higher quality signs on posts? Unsure of the best way forward, but with no other options, in June 1903, the Streets Committee decided to use an appropriation of funds to conduct a summer signage experiment. Installing both letters embedded in cement and iron signs affixed to posts at various points around the city, allowing the public every opportunity to judge of their effectiveness and convenience, the PI wrote. While I unfortunately couldn't find any reports about how those surely hog wild summer months of signage experimentation went, or what Seattleites had to say about them, by season's end, the winter was clearer than an enamel iron street sign. At long, la at long delay, the city is set to inaugurate a system of street signs which will transform the resident districts from a sea of unidentified thoroughfares to a series of properly labeled streets and avenues, along which a stranger can travel with some degree of certainty as to his whereabouts. <laughs> In the business districts, the plates will be uniformly attached to the walls of corner buildings at a height sufficient enough to remove them from the destructive reach of a small boy. <laughs> But at the same time, on an elevation which will enable pedestrians to read the name without effort, the PI reported in September 1903. It is believed that the new signs will prove more satisfactory than those embedded in the concrete in that they are more conspicuous as well as less costly. The long city-wide signage nightmare was seemingly over. 
the metal letters faded into sidewalk obscurity. And as far as my research has taken me, I have not found any evidence of Seattle continuing this practice beyond those summer months of 1903. At long last, I finally had an answer to one of the sidewalk mysteries that had haunted me most. These metal street names in the sidewalk exist today because 120 years ago, it seemed like the only way to deter child vandals, and the council president heard a rumor they were cool. <laughs> I don't know for sure what happened to all those extra metal letters after the iron signs were declared superior, but I suspect at least one small boy may have had the last laugh. On East Mercer Street and 16th Avenue East, the name Frank is spelled out in the paper. <laughs> in what may be Seattle's oldest piece of sidewalk vandalism, the N is actually an M with half of it chopped up, so I guess they ran out of M's. As the Iron Street sign efforts were wrapping up, the city council was ready to let their early 20th century hair down and have some fun. While metal lettering had proved costly and insufficient, perhaps there was another way to take advantage of all the new cement walkways going in around town to further the pedestrian experience in Seattle. It's unclear who initially proposed the idea for blue and white tile street name markers, but the concept was received warmly enough that in June 1904, the summer after the previous failed experiment, it was decided that they would be installed on every single new sidewalk in the city going forward. And it was set to be a busy summer for sidewalk work. Queen Anne's Harry J. Collins was selected for the job, quite fitting as he had established Seattle's very first tile and mantle business after moving from New York in 1889. Joining the many others eager to capitalize on the construction boom happening after the Great Seattle Fire burnt much of downtown to a crisp. The good people of Seattle would need their tiles and mantles, and Collins knew it. Unlike the previously tested metal markers, the lettering of these novel street signs would be larger and more clear, placed where he who runs or even rides past may read, in the words of the Seattle PI. Despite the initial fanfare, if you can call it that, the reign of the tile marker on Seattle streets was extremely short-lived. In December 1904, only six months after the plans were announced and Collins' tile contract awarded, the whole thing was scrapped, with this most unceremonious article in the PI marking their demise. Headline, signs are worthless. <laughs> the street committee, at its meeting yesterday, instructed the Board of Public Works to use no more tiling street signs and pavement, as such signs are considered worthless. End of article. Yes, this was the short mention of tiling street signs I happened to stumble upon under the article about John Calvert that kicked off this whole ordeal. It all comes full circle. Tile guy Harry J. Collins didn't let this loss of the tile contract deter him from tiling about town, but Unfortunately, it wouldn't be for much longer. In May 1910, he left his Marion Street office with tile samples in tow and set off for the 10-minute walk to King Street Station, boarding a train destined for Vancouver, BC. As the train pulled away from the station and entered the Great Northern Tunnel that runs under downtown, Collins fell ill. By the time the mile-long tunnel had concluded at the waterfront, so had his life. Across sidewalks today, his passion for tiles lives on. I was so excited about the possibility that the blue and white tile street name markers all stem from six weird months between June 1904 and December 1904, but my mom always said that if something sounds too good to be true, it probably is, and this felt so good. I wanted to find something else that would back up this timeline, and wouldn't you know it, I got a little bit of help from an old friend none other than Robert Sparger of the Sparger Concrete Company, Seattle's Concrete King. Two of the tile markers I encountered during my walks were accompanied by a clear contractor stamp, one on East Madison Street and 38th, 38th Avenue East with a Sparger Concrete Company stamp, and another in, uh, on East Pike Street and 21st Avenue in the Central District, where the name Fritch & Co. is neatly stamped above a set of tiles. If I could confirm that these sidewalks were paved between June 1904 and December 1904, it would help bolster my case. 
Sure enough, I discovered that the Sparger Concrete Company was awarded the contract to lay sidewalks on both sides of East Madison Street from 29th Avenue East to Lake Washington in June 1904. And Fritch and Co. began their project to pave a portion of East Pine Street that included 21st Avenue in August 1904. Hold for uproarious applause. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I bought myself a hot chocolate too, so. <laughs> as with the metal letter street names, as far as I can tell, I have seen no further evidence that any further attempts were made by the city to continue this worthless practice. Beyond that, as the rise of automobiles began to reshape how cities viewed the experience of traversing a place, it made less and less sense as time went on to continue investing in projects like these. And it seems probable that many of Seattle's remaining tile markers are indeed from the second half of 1904. However, one big caveat to this thrilling tale of Seattle's sidewalk tile tapestry is that it may not apply to the blue and white tile markers seen in Ballard today. Ballard was a separate municipality from Seattle until 1907, and as such, wouldn't have been subject to the same 1904 tiling whims as the big city. Of course, it's always possible that Ballard got a little jealous and copied Seattle, but I can't say for sure what the story is. Additionally, even if they were installed around the same time, the ones you see today may not be the original. In the mid-1990s, the Central Ballard Community Council received a grant from the Department of Neighborhoods to place new tile street name markers in the same style, using the neighborhood's old street names. As I mentioned earlier, East Madison Street towards Lake Washington is a hotbed for what I believe to be the original 1904 tile street name markers. If you want to check them out sometime, tell your friends. But did the hopeless, embarrassing chaos of street signs in Seattle end after those beautiful iron signs were posted? No, of course not. A 1911 headline in the Times declared, the fight for street signs still rages with the periodical agitation over and about street signs that Thomas Proch had written about nearly a decade before still alive and well. This time, the city was slow to react after a street renaming project scrambled things up, with a Seattle PI letter writer from a suffering new Seattleite saying she had been sadly embarrassed by the lack of street signs. Whenever signs needed replacement, which was often, there was drama. Whenever street names changed, there was drama. Every single decade into the 1960s, street signs were a constantly discussed issue in Seattle. In 1950, the Seattle PI, under the headline, Let's Grow Up, wrote, Seattle street signs constitute one of its most glaring shortcomings. There aren't enough of them. They aren't placed correctly, and many of them are completely illegible. As a result, not only the stranger in our midst, but many an old-time resident has a difficult time finding his way around. It is ridiculous that such a situation has been tolerated so long in a metropolitan city. The Seattle traffic engineer in charge of repairing signs defended himself, saying that while signs were constantly being replaced or refurbished, the small boy with the rock in his hand <laughs> is our greatest enemy of street signs. The scourge of the Seattle small boy. <laughs> the green and white reflective street sign style we know today, which was first let loose across the cityscape between 1962 and 1964, actually ushered in the period of relative calm that we are currently living in. So it only took 60 years after the first real signage system was installed in 1903 for the city to figure it out once and for all. Non-embarrassing street signs in Seattle are only as old as the Space Needle. After the 1960s, complaints about street signs dwindled. New problems emerged. Small boys became big boys, and then new small boys came along. Life moves on, and with time, this drama that had gripped the city for so many decades was largely forgotten until tonight, when we can all just sort of shrug it off. After all, so much has changed in Seattle after these stories played out. Belltown residents need not worry about wading through mud up to their knees on most days, and coal shoot crimes are exceedingly rare, but Honestly, so much hasn't. 
I think that's what compels me to dig up these stories. What makes every frenzied 2 a.m. newspaper clue chase worth it? Learning forgotten stories from Seattle's past gives me a much deeper appreciation and understanding of where we are now. These stories are reminders that progress doesn't happen overnight and that each decade has brought with it its own dreams, dramas, discontents, and worthless infrastructure improvement projects. And somehow, some way, Seattle is still here, each street a miniature museum of history and industry hiding in plain sight. Regardless of what compels me to share these stories, I feel grateful every single day that I have been given the opportunity to, and I sincerely appreciate you all being here this evening. When I left my apartment in 2017, and then later when I decided to share a Seattle Walk Report, I could never have imagined it would take me on the journey that would lead me here. And I really appreciate you all being here tonight, and thank you to the good people in Mohai for inviting me to speak at History Cafe. I'm happy to answer any of your burning questions. Is there anything else? Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to have an audience Q&A, and we'll have a couple wireless mics here to run over to you. And so raise your hand, and we'll bring you a microphone. Hello. Hello. Thank you for that wonderful speech. Um, what do you make of the one uh, Madison Street tiled sign in which the three ultimate characters are upside down? Yes, I wish I could just go back here to see. Oh yeah, there we go. Um, there are quite a few. Um, honestly, when I read about how rapidly a lot of the sidewalks went in, especially during the summer that these tiles went in, I wouldn't be surprised if they were just like, we've got these tiles, we gotta go, go, go. You know, somebody sitting on one side, somebody sitting on the other side. Um, yeah, there are ones, um, I believe I even seen one, I don't think I included it in this presentation where the name itself was spelled wrong. So it wasn't even just that the letters were upside down or anything. I think they were probably just tired. <laughs> Could we have the names of some of the sources that you cited in the middle of your speech about, um, I'm trying to remember some of the names, yes, uh, not just the SPL website. Yes. For the digital newspapers, but there's something about historical buildings. Yes, it's from the Seattle Department of Neighborhoods. Isn't it fun to take this trip back some time here? <laughs> <laughs> so it's the Seattle Historical Site Search from the Seattle Department of Neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And if you just do an internet search for that, it will be one of the first results that um, comes up at Seattle Historic Site Search. And then the other ones were just general photo archives through the University of Washington, Mohai the Seattle Public Library, and the Seattle Municipal Archives, um, which you can all find just by doing a search for those. But I really recommend, this is like a hidden wonder. Um, I was really surprised the first time I found it. Like I said, there isn't a result for every building in town, but when there is a result, and it will often just be random houses on the streets, and you'll learn this rich history about them and the people who lived in that house or people who were connected with the house, so I really recommend it. It's really cool. Thank you. Um, th there's a few parts to this question. Has has writing and this research become your vocation? And uh, what if if it wasn't your vocation before? What was your vocation <laughs> before? And could you just talk about the experience of having this passion or? hobby or whatever it was become something that is, is your professional life now? Yeah, so actually, um, I'm kind of a big believer in not quitting your day job. Um, <laughs> so I actually work for the Seattle Public Library. I'm not here as like a mole to like, uh, this is my free time, my free agency is here promoting library resources. Um, but, uh, so yeah, I do work at the Seattle Public Library. I've worked there for 12 years, so I was working there when I started Seattle Walk Report and I still work there. Yeah, diving into uh, you know old concrete construction manuals just doesn't pay the bills for some reason. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, yeah, I mean it's been it's been a really interesting experience. I feel really lucky 
that I've been able to combine these two passions of mine. Like I said at the beginning, drawing is something that I've always loved to do. And even though I've never had any real training for it, it's just like something that's always been there, but just didn't really have a way of coming out. And then when walking came along, it was just like, it felt like this perfect kind of combination of these two things that I felt like were just so totally me. Like when you combine those two things together, out comes Seattle Walk Report. Um, so I don't know, it's been really cool. I honestly, because I don't, this might be too much inside boring baseball or whatever, but like, because I don't rely on this for to live, to like keep my lights on and my beans hot, you know, I, uh, I can just have a lot of fun with it and really make sure that I'm passionate about what I'm doing and not to feel like, oh no, I have to write another book because, you know, the coal man's coming to collect his bill and so, yeah. Thank you, good question. Um, uh, related to the uh, cluster lights, uh, some of the lights downtown have like a little teapot on the top. Which is open. You know what I'm talking about? It's probably not a teapot. I think it's a design choice. And I uh, wanted to know if you had any information. I can I'll tell be, by your open mouth what the answer is. <laughs> I'll be back in September 2023 with my findings on that. Thank you very much. You found my next obsession. Related to the teapot lights, are there any uh, other um, little items that have caught your eye that we might read about next September? <laughs> <laughs> well, in my beautiful book, Secret Seattle, uh, an illustrated guide to the city's offbeat and overlooked history, you'll find these stories and many more <laughs> from my grand uh, walks around Seattle. Um, yeah, the ones that I illustrated or talked about here today are some of my favorite ones, the ones where I feel like um, maybe people have seen them, like the cluster lights and that sort of thing. And so it's fun to be able to tell those stories. And then when people see them, they go, oh, I know something about those. Um, that's really fun. Um, there aren't anything, there's nothing on my I can't find anything about this bucket list, those blue and white tiles seriously haunted me for years and years and years. And I don't have anything like that right now, but I'm sure the second I leave here, I'll see something and it'll launch my next book or something. In your original book, oh, yeah, I don't need the oh, so. <laughs> yeah, you can give it to yeah. yeah. Hi, here's a question for you. Sorry about that. I am new here to Seattle, but I'm wondering about the research about how the hills are built or actually are created. I'm kind of curious about that. Does that jive with your research? Have you done anything along those lines? I would really recommend, there's a book by David B. Williams that was mentioned, uh, the author who was mentioned earlier in this, called Too High and Too Steep, all about um, the regrading project in uh, across the city. I actually don't know much about it beyond what he wrote. Um, there are certain things that I am, I really am interested in the things that have visual clues that exist currently, if that makes sense. So like the coal shoots, you can see them and connect them to history and fire hydrants, you can see. And because the regrade doesn't have as many visual clues besides the fact yeah. that certain areas are flat where they I would agree happen. with that because those things you just <laughs> mentioned were things that I actually see myself. Yeah. So I always like to um, I always like to just try to think about those things. So I feel like it makes history so much richer when you can actually see it versus kind of hearing about something in a history book or in a beautiful museum like this where you don't quite have that same connection to it in the present day. Agreed, agreed. Thank you very much. In your first book, you had, um, you had a, you talk about fire hydrants and also fire sprinkler connections. My partner works in that business, and so we were thrilled to see them, of course. But I'm wondering, there's so much construction that's going on now. Is there anything about new construction that you find as intriguing as full sheet covers and utility covers? The thing I 
think about most when it comes to new buildings is which ones will be the treasured ones 60 years from now? Because it seems to be kind of this cycle where you hate every new building going into town and then 40 years down the road, people go, oh, that building has its charm, you know? And so I wonder today, what are gonna be the ones that they say, oh, we have to preserve that bottom glassy layer. It's, it's you know, this perfect illustration of Seattle architecture in the 2010s or whatever, and what we'll be building on top of with something else. So I don't know, that's kind of what I think about. I, I look around and I think like, which one of these are gonna be the ones that the cool Seattleites are gonna be talking about? You know, like, oh, I remember when that was built, you know, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just kind of interesting to see what different styles and things people do. I definitely like the, um, a little bit more of the green construction methods and focus on trees and different elements like that when it comes to building and some considerations that I don't think they made in the same way, you know, decades ago. I think there was a question over here. Yeah. Uh, comment, a question on the lamppost base. I've been looking at those too. I walk a lot. Um, there's a whole bunch of different styles, but there's a medallion on them. Mm -hmm. Some of your pictures. Yes. Some of those medallions are um, uh, fastened on, and small boys or somebody <laughs> likes to steal those as well. There's some newer, well, I don't know where they're from, but there's another period where they were like embossed. Mm -hmm. And now down on the waterfront, the new waterfront, they're putting in similar ones, and those once again are fast and so it's going to be interesting to watch that history yeah it is so. really cool they there are different little emblems on some of the bases and one of them was actually designed by um james i want to say his last name is wen w-e-h-n a uh, seattle sculptor he did the chief self yeah it's like a fish yeah thing. so there's this one with fisher and he actually yeah. designed that one um i don't know if i should admit this but under the christmas tree last year Santa may have brought me my own little uh, lamppost medallion. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how that happened. I did not ask questions of Santa. But uh, yeah, it is cool to see and cool to think that the city is still investing in making these the style of lampposts. They don't have to do that, yeah. you know, but they're doing it anyway. Okay, so now question. So I received an email from David today because mm -hmm. he knows I walk a lot. And he is looking for rubber sidewalks. Ooh. There's a rubber sidewalk on Queen Anne on Bigelow. And each, Dave and I both have vague recollections of a couple of others. So it's really weird to walk on. But anyway, I encourage people to go to Bigelow and walk on the rubber sidewalk. And it's very weird. <laughs> um, but anyway, for your next book, <laughs> well, the history of the rubber sidewalks. Or actually, you're in a race with David. So. You want to he's some stiff competition. I'll yeah, say that. Yeah. So. yeah. Walker against Walker. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's good to know. Thank you. Any other burning questions out there? <laughs> Thanks. Do you happen to know why Woodland Park Avenue North is so wide? You know what I'm talking about? I do it's know like twice as wide as a normal street in those neighborhoods. I don't know, but that is an interesting question. Oh, somebody back here is waving furiously. I, I, I heard something that's so exciting. There is a, a building, okay, for people in cities, they're, they're developers that buy property and they come up with ways of extolling the virtues of people moving to that property. And there is a history of trolleys that are built to parks to, de to promote the development of the housing in that neighborhood. I stumbled on this in a video on YouTube from a guy, a channel called The Funk Plan. Um, this amazing thing. But it is in reference to an amusement park someplace else, but the idea that you would, to, develop, to encourage people to build in a neighborhood, you would build a trolley to that neighborhood and have a an entertainment park there, thereby you know building up more of the housing and the entrance in that neighborhood. Thank you.
Any last, last questions? Thank you. Thank you all for being here. partners at History Link, and thank you to everyone who turned it into the live stream. That's quite exciting. We'll have a recording for you on YouTube as well, so check out your emails for that link once it comes out.